Okie dokie. So guys, today we are uh, going to talk a little bit about Spain. Um, so again, as usual, we're going to start off with a little bit of history and trying to figure out why we are where we are uh, in terms of Spanish wine. And then uh, we're going to just briefly cover the, the regions. And then I want to do a little bit different than usual. And we are going to kind of explore the main regions through the most important wineries there or through kind of the most iconic wineries there. So just a slight variation on what we've normally done, uh, but let's see if it works, okay? So um, let's head on straight to history. So uh, grapes um, in Spain have been actually uh, grown there for a very, very long time. So they, they've actually found grape pips, so like the seeds and stuff like that um, in the tertiary period. So that's a long time ago. Uh, we're not talking about winemaking here, just pure native uh, grapes. Uh, the actual winemaking started same as most of Europe with the Phoenicians somewhere around 4000 BC. <clears throat> so kind of um, along the lines of, of the Georgians and the Armenians and everybody else. So Phoenicians, when they were coming over, they were the, the biggest traders in that time. Um, they brought over winemaking techniques from, from the Caucasus. Um, obviously, same as everybody else, Romans came in, Romans kind of started to develop the culture of drinking as well. It wasn't, it wasn't purely just for, uh, for um, hydration purposes, but they developed this as a culture as well. Um, so Romans were in the territory, they were, um, Sp Spain was one of the biggest exporters of wine even in those days so like all across the roman empire even like when they were bordering uh, britain and all of these countries the soldiers were drinking spanish wines the, the wine was delivered to them the reason for that was because spain was able to produce a lot of yields um, so they had a lot of wine a lot of volume even these days spain is is the third uh, highest producer of of wine in the world but it is by far the first in terms of hectares, right? So they have the most, the most uh, actual vineyard plantings. The reason why they're not first in winemaking is because they, the way the, um, the soil is, they don't uh, put the plants close together, right? So for example, in, in Bordeaux, two vines will be one yard apart. In, in Spain, it's two and a half yards apart. So quite a big difference. So a lot more spacing, a lot lower uh, density. Here. Anyway, moving on in history. So after the Romans, uh, there was a lot of barbarians that kind of took over Spain. There were the Visigoths and the other ones that I can't remember right now. Um, so there were kind of tribes that were, that were running the country and then the Moors came. So the Moors were the, the Muslims that came from, from kind of from Africa. Uh, funny thing about them was that obviously they were Muslim. So Muslims, they don't do alcohol, right? Uh, supposedly. But that was not the rule in those times. They were actually quite happy to not only drink wine, they were happy to make it. They were happy to profit from it. They even put in taxation efforts um, on wine. So Moors were kind of a, a sacrilegious, uh, let's say, in those times. They weren't really following the, the Islamic rules very, very much. But anyway, they were in uh, the rulers of, of Spain for a very, very long time. <clears throat> and that was until the Reconquistas came and they kind of took back uh, Spain to the natives, to the, to the locals. So kind of the, the re, re, Reconquistas um, era finished around the 1400s. And then obviously colonization started. That's why I have Christopher Columbus in the back. So Christopher Columbus, he was, uh, he was Portuguese, but when he went to the New World, he was actually under the, the Spanish flag. He was sponsored by the Spanish um, government. The, the fleet was Spanish. So technically, it was Spain that, that discovered uh, the Americas at that time, not India as they thought. Um, Anyway, so what happened with colonization? We kind of briefly touched on this when we were talking about uh, South America. Um, so obviously Spain needed export markets. They were producing such high volumes of, of alcohol 
as of high volumes of, of wine, that they needed more markets um, to kind of profit from it. So colonization helped them adapt. They, they colonized Cuba, Jamaica, Mexico, and so on, Argentina, Chile. Um, <clears throat> so all of these were, were interesting markets for them for export. Not only for that, they obviously uh, also were pretty good regions to, to make wine uh, themselves, especially Chile, Argentina, and Mexico. Um, so we, we touched on this before. At a certain point, Mexico became the largest producer of wine in the world. And that was a problem for Spain. That was a problem for King Philip III, uh, who was in charge at the time, because suddenly they weren't the big dogs in terms of export anymore, and he banned uh, all of their colonies uh, to to make any more wine. So he he ordered them to uproot all of the vines, pull everything out, and stop making wine. Now, pretty much everybody listened. Mexico listened. Argentina listened. Uh, the only ones that didn't listen were Chile, um, and that's why Chile was kind of on the front foot for a while when it came to New World um, and their wines. Anyway, so when when all of these New World countries stopped uh, producing as much wine, and Chile was a little bit kind of out of the way anyway, but they had the Andes in between and they weren't really uh, such a danger to, to the rest of the world. I mean, Mexico had much better, much better location, Argentina as well, that they could profit from export. So they were fine with it. They didn't really attack them or anything uh, with that. Anyway, um, but Spain, yeah, kept on focusing on their, on their high, high, yield, high yields and everything. Um, so quality wasn't really at their forefront. That's why everybody kind of passed them. And that's why we never really talked about Spanish wine as being high quality until uh, recent years. Because, yeah, like I said, volume was their main thing. Um, they were lucky in one thing. They were lucky with phylloxera. So we talked about phylloxera, the disease that wiped out all of Europe's vineyards. So the reason why, why the Spanish were lucky was because their main wine regions were, were separated by long distances. They were separated by, uh, by mountains and so on. So phylloxera spread very, very, very slowly. So while most of Europe was hit in around 1850s, phylloxera only hit Spain in the early 1900s. And by that time, they were ready for it. They knew that the, the grafting on the American rootstock would work, that it would prevent uh, the spread of it. Um, so they were smart enough in most areas and they've already started this grafting. And um, so while everybody else got super hit and kind of uh, trashed their economy for, for a very, very long time, um, the Spanish didn't, didn't feel it as much. They were better prepared. So that was, that was lucky for them. Unfortunately, that, that didn't change their thinking about producing quality wine at the time. They were a little bit... Um, too traditional, a little bit too old school. A lot of people said that they were just kind of a little bit too lazy um, to work with wine. There's, there's a lot of actually historians that were talking about this in the past um, and just yeah, kind of trashing uh, the Spanish for their winemaking and that with the terroir they have, that they should really be focusing more on quality wine. But they didn't really listen. Um, they had major problems with um, you know, their siestas and stuff like that. That's, that's not just something we say, siestas were actually a thing. And that was a problem for winemaking because if you pick the grapes in the morning and you brought them to the winery at 12, suddenly nobody was there because everybody was, it was too hot outside. You couldn't really do much work. Um, so the grapes ended up sitting there, just kind of started to ferment in the, in the buckets, in the, in the boxes or whatever. Um, so again, that didn't help with the quality of wine. Um, that only changed with time as mechanization came in and they started uh, with mechanics. They were able to pick the grapes at night. Um, so it kind of, uh, that, that started changing the quality um, of the wine. So yeah, pretty much up until 1970s, they were, they were not really considered a quality producer. They were just focused on their, on their volume, volume wines. But then suddenly things started changing. Uh, and especially in, in the 1990s, there was a big resurgence of, of high quality wine. And this is kind of what we're going to cover today with those wineries that I've chosen uh, that I think were kind of instrumental of changing the perception of the wine world on Spain. Okay, cool. Any questions about history? Clear. <laughs> Sorry? It's clear. <laughs> no questions. Yeah, history, I know it's always a bit of a, it, it sounds like a boring subject, but it's kind of imperative to understand it because that makes you 
makes you understand the thinking behind everything and, and, and why things change. Um, I put 2019 there as well because there was a new regulation change in 2019 specifically for, for Rioja um, to kind of even further improve the quality. <clears throat> but we'll just briefly touch on that when we get to that. Okay, so Spain, this is Spain uh, and, it's, and it's kind of main regions. Now, um, one thing you will notice is that most of Spain is actually based on big, uh, big flatlands, right? So they're surrounded by hills and then, for example, La Mancha, you see it's all flat and then hills all the way around. Um, now, what is, why this is important is because those, those hills kind of shield you from everything else and they, they, um, they give you a constant environment. So something you can relatively count on. Um, so even though the, the terroir, the geography in general of, of Spain is fairly difficult, it's kind of a dry area, they do have problems with drought all the time, it's hot during the day, freezing during the night sometimes, um, but they can at least count on that and they can adapt to that, so that helps out a lot. Um, so in terms of regions, the, the regions that you definitely need to know, obviously uh, Rioja, all the way up here next to the Ebro River, um, one of the most important regions, the first uh, DOC. Um, so just to clarify, uh, uh, Italy has DOC and DOCG. So DOC meaning kind of a, uh, a regional quality guarantee, whereas DOCG means a, a particular tiny part of that region that has a super high quality uh, of wine. Spain is, they, they drop one of the letters. So an equivalent to Italian DOC would be DO, so Denominación Origen, um, or DOC, uh, Denominación Origen uh, Qualitada. <coughs> you might see it as DOQ as well uh, for, for Catalonia, because it's a different language. Um, so La Rioja was the first DOC, so first top quality um, region. Uh, the first DO was in 1982, was Ribera del Duro, so this one, over here next to the Duero um, River. Definitely remember this one, very, very important region as well, mainly for the high quality of wines that they make. Um, Galicia, you need to know about Rias Baixas and Bierzo. We'll go through them <coughs> as we go through the wineries. Uh, in Catalonia, definitely you need to know about Priorat. Ideally, if you like good stuff, Monsant as well, um, and Penedès. And then, Kind of that's that's it of the main ones. Maybe Toro is an important one as well, especially in the late years, and obviously Jerez and, and all of Andalusia. But we're not going to cover that today because it is um, it is focused on on sherry and fortified wines, which I want to do in a in a separate session, to, not to confuse anything. Um, I do want to point out two other regions that people constantly forget about. Uh, and these are the islands. You've got Mallorca over here, which makes some of the most spectacular wines uh, in the planet, but people, for some reason, don't really uh, take them seriously. Uh, the other ones are the Tenerife, the Canary, sorry, the Canary Islands, and especially Tenerife. Um, who's this loud one? Um, <clears throat> especially Tenerife makes some of the most spectacular wines, obviously being a volcanic island, uh, you've got a lot of that freshness, a lot of that acidity, in spite of thinking of Tenerife as this really super hot climate. Um, so that volcanic, volcanic soil just brings out the freshness, brings out the acidity, and, and it makes some, some really, really good wines. Um, so good value as well, both from, uh, well, not as much from Mallorca. Mallorca tends to be expensive, but the Tenerife um, Canary Island wines are generally really, really good value. So if you see them on a wine list somewhere, uh, definitely give them a go. Um, in terms of grape varieties, <clears throat> main grape uh, for mo main red grape for most of uh, Spain will be Tempranillo, uh, and the other one equally high in quantity is Garnacha or Grenache, as we know it in in France. Um, Garnacha should be the correct way to name it because it is a Spanish grape. They they finally decided on that uh, not too long ago. Uh, other important grapes, uh, Monastrel. Monastrel is the same grape as Mourvedre in, in France. Um, and you will find some other red grapes that we'll talk as we get to them. Um, in terms of white, uh, Viura uh, is probably the most famous white grape. You can find it in Rioja. You can find it pretty much anywhere. 
um, but yeah, especially in, in Rioja, it, it is a high quality grape. The other one that is kind of more uh, volume based is Ayren. Um, <clears throat> it's one of the most planted white grapes variety in Spain, mainly due to the reason because it's grown in the, the massive region of La Mancha. Um, so you can, obviously that brings up the, the, the volume of it quite a bit. <clears throat> and last, last two, I would definitely mention Verdejo and Albarini. Okay, now let's go to the kind of more fun part. Uh, so I want to go through kind of the wineries that, that changed the way people think about, about Spain. And one of the first wineries that really made a mark um, a fairly long time ago was Vega Sicilia. So Vega Sicilia is a winery that was founded in 1864 uh, in Rivera del Duero. So the owner was this guy called Don Eloy Lecanda y Chavez. Don't, don't, don't laugh at my, my Spanish. I'm not great at it. <laughs> um, so he's a guy that trained in Bordeaux. So most of the Spanish winemakers that kind of made a difference all brought in new winemaking techniques and new grapes as well from, from Bordeaux. Uh, it was a relatively short travel for them. Uh, some of them went by sea, but most of them did travel by, by horse. Um, so when they were, when they trained in Bordeaux, they, they learned what Spanish always lacked was the acidity, right? Because it's so hot, so warm, they had problems with wines not lasting time, not, uh, not standing the test of time. Um, so when they went to Bordeaux, they finally learned how to kind of harness that and kind of figure out how to, how to keep the freshness, but still remain the power that is so specific for them. Um, so yeah, what was so interesting about Vega Sicilia was that he brought over uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, he brought over Merlot uh, and Malbec as well, um, even though Tempranillo was the main grape at the time. And, and Spanish weren't really known for kind of experimenting with international grape varieties. But this was the first bit. And especially Cabernet allowed them to produce some really, really high quality, uh, really interesting styles of wine. Um, Vega Sicilia, still grown today, not in the same hands anymore, uh, but they have three kind of really, really special wines that you can still find. Um, Unico being the main one, it is kind of the equivalent of a Grand Reserva wine, uh, which means that it's aged for five years, uh, really, really powerful, really strong uh, styles of wine. Still has a high content of Cabernet Sauvignon uh, in it as well, which is relatively unique. Uh, the second wine, kind of second wine, is Valbuena Number no. Five, which is also aged for a minimum of five years. Um, and then they have a special one. All of these wines are kind of ex expensive; they're like two hundred quid a pop uh, in in retail. Um, Unico Especial is quite interesting as well because it's a, always a blend of different vintages. It's not a particular vintage; it's a blend of all of the top Unicos. So it's kind of the the creme de la creme of of their whole. Whole production. Um, but anyway, the reason why I mentioned Vega Sicilia was because they put Ribera del Duero on the map. So where Rioja was the first DOC, Ribera del Duero was actually the first DO. Uh, so in 1982, the first denomination origen uh, was founded and this was Ribera del Duero. So they were the first people that um, that, that, that saw that their wines were so very different to anything else in Spain that they wanted to to classify that. Um, and Vega Sicilia was one of the main ones. So like I said, they were playing around with different grape varieties, um, but it was still, it, it had its own kind of um, signature to it. Okay. Um, the other Ribera del Duero winery that is more than iconic, I would say, it's it's one of the recent ones, the winery only, well not the winery, the blend only started being produced in 1995. Um, so fairly recent, but again, this kind of cemented uh, Ribera del Duero as the top uh, high quality production of, of Tempranillo. So Pingos was started by Peter Sisek. He's a, he was a Danish winemaker. I mean, who thinks about Denmark and wine, right? Um, but he was, a, he was a funny guy. He was brought over to, to, to Spain to work on one of the projects. Um, and he kept on looking at the hills in Ribera del Duero. And in those hills, you could find a lot of these very, very old uh, vine tempranillos. Um, so kind of the first ones that were uh, 
planted to prevent phylloxera, the first wines that were uh, grafted. So some of these vines are from, nine, from early 1900s, so more than 100 years old now. And he was looking at those grapes and he said, wow, these must be some of the most amazing wines ever. Um, and he started making them. Um, so he kind of focused, in, contrary to what Vega Cecilia was doing, he focused on this uh, Tempranillo. Now, like I was saying, this Spain, even though they started to focus a little bit more on quality, they still had a lot of yields, a lot of volume. Um, so what Peter Sisek is mostly famous for is uh, controlling the vine. So he did extensive pruning. He was cutting down the, the vines to concentrate the flavors even more, to restrict yields, to make less but more um, quality. So a lot of people, so anyway, so he made this wine and he, so he made it in 1995. <clears throat> in 1996, he went to Bordeaux to one of the on premier tasting. So obviously 96 is not that far along, uh, far long ago. Um, so Bordeaux was already the top place in the world to be. So he comes in with his little Pingus. Uh, Pingus was actually his childhood nickname. That's why he named the winery like that. Uh, I'd rather not guess why they called him that. Um, and he brings this wine over and everybody laughs at him. What, what the fuck are you doing here? This is a Bordeaux tasting. What are you doing here with a Spanish wine? And they tasted it blind and it kicked everybody's ass. It, was a, it got 100 points, uh, Parker points. We were talking about this. <clears throat> in some of the previous sessions and at the end of the week uh, of these tastings everybody was just like pingus 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 everybody was just talking about this um, so once he did this everybody started copying him everybody started doing this extensive pruning in Ribera as well and, and the region itself just started uh, really changing dramatically um, so while people were trying to copy Vega Sicilia before not a lot of them were <clears throat> maybe brave enough uh, to put international grape varieties. Um, and they had these Tempranillo vines, but they didn't consider Tempranillo to be a, a top quality grape until Pingus uh, or Peter Sisek for that matter, started, started this extensive pruning and just kind of changed everything. Anyway, in 2001, he became biodynamic uh, completely and still makes the wine today. And yeah, good luck finding it. It's very, very rare, very, very hard to get. Um, but yeah, important wine in the progress of Ribera del Duero. So <laughs> Ribera del Duero also got a um, option to become a DOC. They were actually approved for it, but for some reason they didn't follow through. They didn't actually want to become a DOC. So they are still to this day only a DO in spite of having the, the quality to get there. Okay, uh, some of you might be surprised that I didn't start with Rioja as one of the main regions in, in Spain, but I just felt like uh, Ribera del Duero doesn't get enough attention, so maybe we should start with that. That being said, obviously, Rioja is probably the most important, most famous, uh, most recognized region um, in Spain, at least, if not in the world. Um, and it was mainly down to two wineries, and one of them that is still around today and still makes some of the most outstanding Riojas is the Marques de Murieta. <clears throat> so the winery obviously founded in Rioja in 1855, uh, but what was a really turning point for them was when in 1870s, uh, they moved to the Igai Castle, which is the one that you can see in the picture in the back. Beautiful castle. So this is uh, this has been recently refurbished. So the photo is already of the refurbished castle, but um, it is basically as it was 150 years ago. Absolutely gorgeous stuff. Um, so yeah, so they were consistently making some of the best Riojas. They are very conservative in their approach, very traditional in their approach. After all, they were the ones that that kind of set it in stone uh, before before they were consistently producing good wines. Uh, people were, weren't really focusing on what should go in the blend and they were just doing whatever they had in the vineyards. Uh, but they kind of formatted it in a way where Tempranillo and Garnacha were the main two grapes and then supplemented with a few other grapes like Graciano and Mazuelo even. Um, but yeah, they were very focused on Tempranillo and they were kind of the first ones to realize that Tempranillo is very good with American oak. And American oak, as opposed to French oak, was a cheaper, much, much cheaper. Uh, and two, had much more flavor to add to the, to the wine. So where 
the, the French oak is going to add a little bit more of those green notes like dill and, and menthol. Uh, the American oak adds a lot of coconut, a lot of vanilla. And this worked really, really well with the flavors of Tempranillo. So Tempranillo has all of these like black fruity, jammy flavors. Um, and that vanilla and coconut really, really worked well with it. Um, so yeah, these were kind of the modern guidelines for everybody else. And everybody started using American oak. Like I said, one for, for the price and the other ones because the, the flavors really complemented well. Um, so generally when we talk about Rioja, even though this has changed in recent years, we will still talk about them being aged in American oak uh, and having a lot of this vanilla and coconut flavors. Um, anyway, they were making some of the best Riojas, like I said, but then in the 80s it started kind of dropping off, which was kind of unfortunate because, as I said, at that time Ribera del Luero got their first uh, DO. Uh, Rioja wasn't a DO at the time. Um, so the quality started dropping off in the winery, but then I think in 96, yeah, 95 or 96, they were, they were purchased by, by a new family um, and they were, the estate was reinvigorated and now they're back at the top. Um, so their, their main wine, the, the, the iconic wine that you will find from Marquez de Murieta, Murieta is the, the Igai, Castillo de Igai. Uh, absolutely gorgeous wine. It's just incredibly complex, very scented. A lot of these like spicy, but like sweet spice uh, aromas to it, which is really interesting and still a lot of freshness. So um, again, similar to, to Vega Sicilia, they were also um, consistently learning from the, from the Bordeaux guys and just kind of developing really good stuff. Um, I actually wanted to start it with Alvaro Palacios. Alvaro Palacios is, he, for me, is one of the most important guys in Spain because uh, unlike the other wineries, he wasn't focusing on one region uh, and he wanted to develop the country in general. Um, so he comes from, um, from a winemaking family. They owned an estate in Rioja. Um, and when he was 20 or so, um, he also went to Bordeaux and he studied with no other than, than Chateau Pichus, um, obviously one of the arguably most important estates in the world. Um, and even in the 80s when he was there, they were already pretty serious winemakers. So he studied with them and then when he came back home, he said I, I, he wanted to come back to his family, but they didn't really give him free reign. They didn't allow him to do whatever he would want to do. Uh, so he said, okay, screw you guys, I'm just gonna go on my own. Uh, and he went to a tiny little region uh, called Priorat. So Priorat is um, in Catalonia, just kind of north east, uh, on the northern eastern coast of, of Spain. Um, and today it is famous for Grenache, uh, or for Grenache. And the reason for that is this guy, Alvaro Palacios. So he took all of his knowledge from Bordeaux, from winemaking, and he is, I mean, if you ever get a chance to, to speak to the guy, he is incredibly knowledgeable. There's, there is so much, um, so much information that, that he holds in his head and understands uh, how winemaking and wine growing works, that it's insane. Anyway, so he went there and um, he, Garnacha was always kind of a, a bulk wine. It was, it was good, it was delicious, but it wasn't really ever famous for making high quality wines. And he changed that. Uh, he really focused on kind of old vines, high altitude, um, again, a lot of that freshness, a lot of that acidity, and quite a bit of structure as well. So one of his most famous wines is called Lermita. It's one of the most expensive wines uh, in the world that you can find it. Um, and yeah, this was kind of the turning point from Priorat. And Priorat is now the other DOC of Spain. So today we only have two. One is La Rioja, the other one is Priorat. And yeah, mainly down to this guy. Now, like I said, he wasn't only famous for uh, staying in one place, so Priorat being in Catalonia, um, he also, once he made his, uh, a name for himself, he went back to his family estate um, in Rioja and kind of improved quality there as well because now he finally had the, the trust um, of them to, to get it done. Um, and their winery is called uh, Bodegas Palacios Remondo. Again, similar to Marques de Murieta, probably one of the top, top estates in Rioja. So he developed that as well. And again, a lot of people started copying his methods, copying his techniques. So his approach was very much 
uh, kind of a terroir driven approach as well. Um, and again, this was not something that was common in, in Spain. They were, their wines were made to be <coughs> easily drunk. They weren't meant to be complex uh, at the time. And again, the perception changed from him. Um, and kind of the most important uh, aspect of, of Palacios is probably developing another region called Bierzo. So Bierzo is in Galicia, which is in the northwest of Spain, um, right on the Atlantic uh, Ocean. So they get a lot of those o o um, oceanic influences. And the main grape here is a grape called Mencia. Now, I, when I tried Mencia for the first time, when I tried Bierzo for the first time, it was like one of the weirdest experiences of my life. You smell the wine and it just smells like a Pinot Noir. It smells funky, it smells like a farmyard, um, it's got all of those fruity flavors. And then you try it and it's very weird. And it was just like a feeling of, I like it, I hate it, I like it, I hate it. It was a very, very weird uh, feeling trying it. But then once that flavor settles into you, it's kind of like a, you need to adapt to it a little bit. It just becomes one of the most beautiful wines that I've ever had. And to me, Mencia is the Pinot Noir of, of Spain. Um, so if you ever get to find it, <clears throat> please, please give it a chance. Um, so how he started in Bierzo, there's this guy called Raul Perez, uh, very much like the, the Didier Dagenau um, of Bierzo. Um, again, a, quite, a, quite a erratic, uh, guy but obsessed with with perfection obsessed with all of these things um, and he today is famous for his uh, Albarinos but he actually started with Bierzo he started with the Mencia and um, so Albarino tends to be grown just a little bit more towards the coast in in, in Riaz Baixas which you can see on the map there I'm not gonna go back now uh, you can have a look at it there um, but he didn't have vineyards there so Raul Perez um, a guy came in that said, I want to make uh, red wines in, in Galicia. So he sold him his Mencia grapes, but he wanted in return uh, to get some Albarino, some white grapes, so he could make his own. And Raul Perez was, he's a, a foodie. He likes to travel the world. He likes to go to different restaurants. And he's got three favorite restaurants um, in the world. And one of them is Sketch um, in London, where I worked. So the funny thing was that his Albarinos, his top three Albarinos, are actually named after the, the, the three favorite restaurants that he has. So there is a, there is a, a white Albarino called Sketch uh, that he makes, uh, which is it's amazing. It's, Albarino is normally famous for being a light, fresh style of wine, but he makes it in like a Burgundian style, which is it's just got a bit more complexity, a bit more body, uh, quite high in alcohol as well. So very, very interesting style of wine. Anyway, so Raul Perez, uh, like I said, important for, for Mencia, but he didn't really promote Bierzo enough. People didn't really get to know the, the region because of him. Uh, they got to know the region because his nephew, Ricardo Perez, started working with Alvaro Palacios, uh, and they started a, a winery called Descendientes de uh, Julio Palacios, which was, um, I think he was the dad of Alvaro, um, and they started making, like I said, Bierzo and then later on Albarinos as well. And they were, yeah, they kind of brought Bierzo to the fore to make it into the high quality production area that we know today. So like I said, Alvaro Palacios, in my mind, probably one of the most important ones uh, for Spain as a whole. Okay, moving on, Numancia, you might have heard of this before. Um, so Numancia is based in Toro and Toro is, um, kind of on the uh, Duero River, uh, further west of Ribera del Duero. It's actually closer to um, Portugal than, than it is to um, pretty much any other wine region in, in Spain. Um, and they have this grape uh, called Tinta de Toro. Um, <coughs> Tinta de Toro is basically Tempranillo. However, it is ungrafted. So it is still on its native uh, roots. Um, if you look at the picture in the back, so this is the picture of the actual vineyard there, and if you look at the soil, it's all sand and gravel. And as we've learned, phylloxera doesn't survive in sand and in gravel. And um, again, if you look at the picture, this is just a massive, like a, a plateau, um, and it's on top of like a hill. <clears throat> so phylloxera really didn't make it up here ever. 
Um, so this allowed for these vines to be incredibly, incredibly old. And because they've been separate from any other uh, vines for so long, they've kind of mutated and Tinta de Toro, even though it is technically Tempranillo, the same Tempranillo as you would find in the rest of Spain 100 years ago, these days um, they are nothing, they're not similar at all. They've adapted uh, completely. Um, so Numenthia is actually owned by LVMH, so Louis Vuitton Moyer Hennessy, uh, which I'm sure you, you've you heard of and they've probably done a, a, a training for you. Um, but yeah, they found this vineyard um, you know, the, the grapes have been here for over 100 years, 150 years, some of them. And the wines are just incredibly deep, incredibly concentrated. I mean, look at the vineyards in the back. They don't look, they're just like little bushy uh, things. <clears throat> the reason why they're like that is one, because of the wind. Uh, the other thing is because during the day, it can be 40 degrees here, but at night, it can go very, very cold, even freezing. Uh, in the winters in Toro, sometimes it will be minus 20 degrees, uh, incredibly cold. Um, but that's why they put the grapes so low. So because the sunshine during the day heats up the soil, heats up the rocks, heats up the sand. Um, during the night, they kind of radiate the heat and they keep the, the vines warm so they don't actually freeze to death. Uh, so it's a very important way of, of protecting the vineyards like that. Um, anyway, Numenthia, uh revitalize the region and put Toro on the map. So before, I think late 2000s, nobody really thought about Toro at all. But then Numenthia started um, promoting their wines. And then obviously later they were acquired by LVMH as well, which helps with the money they have. Um, and yeah, they, they produce some of the most amazing wines in the world. Their top wine is called Termanthia. Um, and it's it's not that expensive for what it is. It's around 150 quid um, in, in retail, but it is at the, at the very top of, of Spanish high quality wine production. And that's it for me for today, guys. A little bit of a quicker one. I didn't want to go too deep because it's a lot of information here. Uh, one thing I should maybe mention is, uh, I'm going to chat here. Uh, somebody asked, in M we have Salentine Numantia. No, we have Salentine Numina, and Salentine is from um, Argentina. So different one. We do have Numantia and Tarmantia, though. Um, one thing I should have mentioned is that up until 1996, uh, Spain, same as pretty much everywhere else in Europe, was not allowed to um, irrigate. So there was no water. So they had a lot of problems with drought. Uh, but in 1996, they allowed for uh, irrigation. Um, and they were smart enough to not try to develop their own systems, but they brought in Australian winemakers. They flew them in. And um, because what the problem would be in Spain, because the days are so hot, um, and if you, if you just kind of sprayed the vines on top of them, that water would evaporate very, very quickly. Um, so the Australians, because they had a similar problem down there, they figured out a way of underground um, uh, irrigation. So basically, it's like a drip irrigation. They put, they put uh, pipes underneath the soil, and it just kind of slowly releases water. And it releases it directly into the soil, not on top of it. So the sun doesn't get to it, and it keeps it uh, wetter for longer. Um, and also, they use up much less water than they would otherwise. Um, and this kind of, again, all part of the reason why Spain is now becoming a serious player, becoming a serious high quality producer because of all of these modern techniques that they've, they've um, developed. And like I said earlier, in 2019, Rioja kind of got a new classification system as well, where um, they started focusing on single vineyard uh, stuff as well. So they're, they're going in the right direction. And I think depending on how Bordeaux and Burgundy adapt, we might see Spain kind of coming into the mix um, in the next 10, 15 years and just really shaking things up. Okay. So questions, guys, let's go. We've got a question in chat. When I talk about volume, what do I practically mean? Um, so basically we mean that 
if if a hectare of wines um, will bring you um, let's say 20 hectoliters of wine in in a normal country in Spain you will get 40 hectoliters of wine okay from the same kind of hectare um, even though their 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 wine density is is low like I said they they didn't for a long time they didn't prune these vines so you get on one vine you would get 10 grapes instead of two grapes if that makes sense okay. Does that answer the question I hope so yes good uh, question yeah as we were talking about uh, pingos mm -hmm. like I went to, you know, I was a bit curious just to see what the price was in general, not just because you're like, if you're lucky to find them, everything. And you find as this Flor de Pingus, mm -hmm. what is it? The second wine. <clears throat> so it's a pretty good, I mean, Flor de Pingus is much, much cheaper, right? Um, yeah, I saw that, that's what I said, okay. Yeah, but it's the, because it's right exactly the same way, so it's like, okay. Yeah, so if you look at, I have it here actually in the picture as well. Oops, where? See the Florida. Um, where, where did I put it? Yes, yeah, so uh, so yeah, yeah, you have it here in the back. Um, so yeah, Fingers was the first one. So like I said, this guy didn't actually have his own vineyards. Um, Peter Sisek. He just saw them in the in the in the hills, and he bought it. He bought the grapes uh, uh, in the first place to make. Pingus. but because it was so successful because it was so good um, sooner or later he he needed more wine to uh, to cope with the demand uh, but obviously not he couldn't do the same quality um, with so much attention that he did with Pingus. so he made Florida Pingus, which is just slightly below it's not really uh, you know a real second wine in him being absolutely poor quality um, but it's just a little bit less impressive and higher volume as well okay still a good wine very very good wine oh. generally with these top class wineries wherever they're from i mean their second wines are not horrible they're always good value you know when we talked about italy we talked about ornelias you know they put a lot of pride in their kind of second and third wines so it's always good good idea to to go for that. None of them will want to damage their reputation by doing a shit wine. Do you know what I mean? So. Yeah, no, of course. Okay. Right. Thank you. Anything else, guys? Any other questions? No? Okay. So, yes, another question. We never talk about medium-bodied Spanish reds. Um, which which ones do you have in mind? I mean, there wouldn't really be. So the question is, if you can see the chat, um, we never talk about medium-bodied Spanish reds. Is there any famous ones? Not particularly famous. Not the ones that you would say um, that are kind of iconic. Although I would say that Bierzo can be um, kind of a, it can be developed into a medium body. Uh, style of wine and you can find like the Palacio stuff or, or Raul Perez stuff that is uh, really really impressive um, but no I mean Spain is not famous for the medium bodied wines they are famous for their for the full body wines because the climate that they have produces that sort of stuff um, you know Priorat might be might be an idea where you could go for like a medium bodied Grenache but even them they tend they tend to produce um, bit more structured stuff they use oak they try to to extract that um monsant could be an interesting one monsant you can find some interesting wines although even again in my mind all of these wines don't fit the bill of a medium bodied uh, style to me they're all relatively heavy i hope that answers Okay. Anything else, guys? Okay, okay. So um, I put this on now the website again. So the this video from today will be up in let's say three four hours. Um, the rest are already up there. The presentation from today is already up, so you can download that as well. 
Um, that's it. Next week on Tuesday at 11 again, we are going to do Portugal. Port probably just Portugal. Let's see. Maybe, maybe if I can um, squeeze something else in, but probably just Portugal on, on Tuesday. All right. Thank you very much, Ayad. Okay, I've got another question here about sparkling wines and the Cavas. So again, I didn't want to specifically, so I skipped Sherry and I skipped Cava uh, because I want to do that a separate session. But just to give you an idea, so Cava is a traditional method sparkling wine uh, that is made in Catalonia, but it can be grown anywhere in Spain. So the grapes can come from anywhere, but it has to be made in, in Catalonia. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of high quality. It can be high quality sparkling wine, but much much cheaper than than champagne. We will cover it in a different session, though. Are they using the the classic grape or local grape? No, they have their own. They have uh, Zarello, um, Zarello Parelada, and one more. Can't remember right now. Uh, they, right. they would rarely use Chardonnay and Pinot. I think they're allowed to now, but I don't think they use it much. Thank you very much. Then. All right, guys. Thank you. And I will see thank you, you on Tuesday. Tuesday. Have a nice weekend, guys. Thank you, too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.